Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who is joining us around the world. Welcome to Creation Conversations. Uh, Joe is absent this week, but very, very understandably, but we'll get onto that in just a hot second. Uh, I'm your host tonight, Sam Jenkins, and with me tonight is our international director, John Mackay. We've got uh, Dr. Diane Eager, and we've also got the Dirt Doc, Dr. Glenn Wilson. How are you guys doing? Doing great. We're alive and well, praise the Lord yes. down under. Yes. <clears throat> indeed, indeed. Uh, so uh, for those who aren't in the know, um, Joe uh, has been in the States for the past uh, couple months. I uh, don't know how you couldn't have noticed that. Um, but uh, he arrived back in the UK this morning um, and he is speeding on down his way after being reunited with his lovely wife um to the uh south coast uh for a field trip tomorrow uh he's got a hired car and uh wind in his hair and uh beard and everything else and it's, it's all it's all gone very well but he had a little bit of a hold up today uh in customs with the various copious amounts of fossils he was bringing back <laughs> and uh, uh and things like that i think i think there was a few uh, raised eyebrows in the uh, <laughs> in customs oh, this yeah. morning um but no worries He's back. It's all gone well. Um, so, uh, Glenn, do you want to update us on what he's been doing just before he uh, came back to the UK? <laughs> well, we had 50 days with him, and he gave 31 talks during those 50 days. Plus, we had five days in the field doing research, three of them filming. And we met with three other creation research institutes during that time, had meetings with their staff. Uh, one of them, I think, two or three different times we met with. So we kept him pretty busy, but especially the last four days, instead of letting him rest before he gets back for more ministry, he had uh, two talks Sunday, a talk Monday, a talk Tuesday, a talk Wednesday. Um, so we did our best to wear him out before he left. Uh, yeah, he's definitely in need of a holiday after this, I think. Yes. <laughs> um, Mm. Right. Uh, Diane, uh, what's been going on with you? Have you got any updates for us on the things sort of newsletter related or anything you've been looking into? Uh, we will have an email newsletter uh, hopefully this week. Um, we always have some ministry news uh, on that and there's um, news about our museums um, and uh, good news for our uh, colleagues in Canada um, in that our Canadian colleague Martin Legamati is... Um, reopening his museum or getting it going again which is a wonderful museum so if you have an opportunity to visit that um, uh, do take it um, but we also have uh, updates from various news sources and so we've got a, a interesting DNA study about where did the people who live in India now where where did they come from and uh, and an interesting story about a win that uh, a scientist has had over the issue of transgender and puberty blockers, and it's got uh, some interesting uh, aspects in terms of uh, peer review and academic freedom. So we'll have a few uh, words to say about that as well. Uh, and uh, general ministry news as well, if John wants to add to that. Uh, <clears throat> well, I'll, I'll just add one thing. Yesterday we had a mini conference at Jurassic Park. You know, our outdoor museum here where we found lots of fossils, including things like this, which when they're polished up, get very mm. nice. But our conference yesterday was on how does wood petrify? Now, as much as you go to high school and they say, oh, the, the minerals move into the wood and that petrifies it, it's nowhere near that simple and usually a long way away mm. from being just a, a false truth. We had a great conference because we were more interested in the inside of this one and we've mentioned this before, but this is from a log, which on the outside is lovely and solid. It's got iron and silica, and you can hit it with a hammer, and you've got to watch out you don't dig your hammer. But this one, we opened up, and inside, it still has wood fibres. Now, how do we know they're wood fibres? Well, if we get a bit closer, you'll see there's brown marks on there where we put the gas gun on, set it on fire, and the fossil actually burned. The timber is still there. Now, when you take bits out, you can use it as a little match. So the question we were having yesterday is, how do you end up with a fossil tree that's beautifully preserved, and yet inside is still wood, and outside is absolutely solid? 
And one thing Daryl brought up to our notice, he said there's petrified sap here. And he was quite right. It looks as if as the tree's been buried, the pressure's gone on it, the sap has been pushed up, and it has petrified slightly differently. So you can tell it's run out of the veins or, or the, the um, reticulation part of the plant mm -hmm. and accumulated where it has now petrified, solid. Of course, what's interesting, some of the trees are covered with hematite. Some of the trees are covered with silica. Some of the trees have all sorts of interesting iron compounds, including jasper uh, and orange quartz, things like that. And, and so we had a great conference, and it really was on looking now, how do we reproduce this in the lab? And, well, the conclusion is getting to be very fast. Yeah, sorry, not the conclusion, uh, but the fact is you have to do it quickly before the tree itself rots. You have to remove it so that the outside uh, is open to minerals and the inside is so cut off from the minerals, you still end up with the wood. No matter how long you give it, it's not time that causes things to petrify. It's the right process. But I think we've said that over and over again. So back to you, Sam. All right. Okay. Um, so uh, according to my notes here, Diane, you have something a little presentation, I think. Yes, tonight's topic, we're looking at uh, rock layers, but I have a, a bit of bi biology to, to start with. Well, it is actually about fossils because people insist that fossils in different layers of uh, rock uh, show us the theory of evolution, uh, show us the history of evolution. Uh, and uh, so if you go to museums, you will usually get pictures of um, different fossils all lined up and they say this one evolved into that one because it's found in a different rock layer. And that's what they're teaching at universities these days. And one of our colleagues sent us uh, some illustrations from a recent university lecture on evidence for evolution. And one of them was about whales. Well, a few years ago, I went to the uh, London Natural History Museum and they had a display about whales. So I thought we could talk about uh, whales. So let's have a look at um, my slides. If uh, Sam, if you could uh, yep, put them up. up there. You're all ready to go. All ready to go. That's wonderful. Yes. So in, um, in this university lecture from this year, actually, uh, was all about the evidence for evolution. And one of the topics was fossil evidence. The fossil record links extinct and extant species. Now extant is just a posh word for living. Okay, so extinct are dead creatures, extant are live creatures. And then in the same uh, graphic, they had this quote, fossilized hind leg bones link living whales with land-dwelling ancestors. Now, notice the, um, the word there, link. What they're saying is that fossil whales that used to have legs are directly linked with um, the whales that we have d these days and the fossil whales used to live on land. And I remember this was the same story that was uh, in the Natural History Museum. Uh, <clears throat> And they gave uh, these examples, these four examples uh, in the, uh, the university notes that uh, we were sent, right? Pachycetus, uh, terrestrial, uh, these are their words, right? That means land dwelling. Rhodocetus, and that's how they spelt it, um, predominantly aquatic, Duridon, and Balena, and they identified Baleena as a recent whale ancestor, but in fact, Baleena are still alive today. Uh, so let's go and have a look at all of those things and see whether they really show uh, a, a transition from one to the other. And there's a point to be made at the end there. So this is Pachycetus uh, at the uh, Natural History Museum. Now, if you looked at a creature like that uh, on its own, uh, what would you say about it? Why, why would you think that that was a whale? Um, and in fact, the 
uh, the paleontologist who found the specimen that this cast is based on, and it was actually uh, quite a good specimen in terms of uh, a lot of the skeleton was there. It wasn't just a few fragments. Uh, he made this comment in one of the news reports about it back in 2001 when it was first reported in the, in the scientific news. Um, he said, everyone will agree that these creatures are whales. Now, do you agree that that's a whale? <laughs> All right. Why would he say that? Okay, the reason is, is because this is uh, a, a quote from the, the news source, which we wrote about in our fact file, so you can look up the details of this. They have several strange bones in their ears that only occur in whales. And in fact, what they have is an, an ear structure that um, enhances what's called bone conduction. That's vibrations in, your, in the skull, um, which are then transmitted to your ears. And uh, But it turns out that burrowing animals also have um, enhanced bone conduction, so it's not actually unique to whales. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, going back to our transition, so that's where they've started the whale story. Uh, there is supposedly a transition from Pachycetus to a creature called Rhodocetus, and that is the trans transition from land to water. Now, the Natural History Museum didn't have much to say about Rhodocetus because even though it is, um, it looks like a semi-aquatic creature, uh, it's not considered to be on the direct um, line from terrestrial creatures to uh, whales these days. So, in fact, this uh, so-called modern university lecture is actually out of date. The uh, the, the uh, main scientist who studied Rhodocetus actually admitted um, that this is a, a semi-aquatic creature, but it doesn't have the features that uh, you would expect to find in a whale, uh, ma mainly in its tail. But anyway, the um, we're looking at leg bones, and they did actually find some leg bones uh, of Rhodocetus. Uh, they weren't on display at the Natural History Museum. This is from the Field Museum of Natural History in uh, in Chicago. And sure enough, this thing does have uh, hip bones connected to its spine and it has leg bones. Uh, but there are lots of semi-aquatic creatures that still have legs and still have their hip bones connected to their spine. And there's no sign that they are turning into whales. They are just well-designed semi-aquatic creatures that are well designed to to swim uh, anyway the next step was this creature uh, Dorodon which was in the Natural History Museum because it's considered to be part of the the step going to modern whales and it does have some tiny little bones in its pelvic region now this is um the way they had it mounted, it was uh, in a diving position. It was very hard to see these, but if you looked up in the rafters, you could see there were some tiny little bones. And then the, um, <clears throat> the next step was Balina. And now these are actually alive today. They are called bowhead whales, and they do have some little bones, again, in their pelvic region, but not connected to their spine. So they're not used for walking. Uh, in fact, they don't even project from, from their body. They are actually stabilizers for their, um, for their pelvic organs. And you can actually see these in modern day whales. But I want to go back to this whole idea of transition, because transition is an active process. So you are never going to see it in the fossil record. Even if you have um, different creatures in different layers and you can line them up in a sort of succession from a full leg to, a, um, to what looks like the, the remains of a leg. No one has actually seen that happen. Now, uh, what I mean by transition is it is an active process and there's no proof unless it's observed. So we do observe some quite um, uh, huge transitions in biology. For example, a tadpole to a frog, that's a huge transition, but you can actually watch that happen. But in the next generation, it just goes back to the same cycle. 
Right. Has anyone seen this sort of transition from Pachycetus to Rhodocetus to Dorodon to Bellina? And the answer is no. No one has seen any of those creatures change. All we've got are the individual specimens that are buried. And the fact that they are in different rock layers doesn't mean that one has turned into another. They are all dead. All of our observations on fossils are that they are all dead. So they are not doing anything. And the fact that we can line them up in what looks like a sequence to us is just a, a way of explaining or organizing our knowledge. And that's what we've done in biology and in geology. The evolutionists have taken over what is quite a good classification system. In other words, how to organize our knowledge so that we can remember it and, uh, and build on it. And they have turned it into an active process which no one has actually observed. Now, if we can come back to us, um, I think John has some more uh, to add about this. But do we have any thank yous uh, yet, Sam, or uh, anything? Uh, no, not as of yet. No, I don't think not we've got yet. any All thank right. yous. Um, mm. Yeah, I think we'll just move on to the next. Next, next Sam will just have to up our level so that they get so excited oh. they'll want to donate a thousand dollars with no trouble at all to help Joe as he goes and does the mm -hmm. homeschooling conference and the field trips on the south coast and of course to encourage us as well mm -hmm. but thank you Diane for that because these talks today are, are based on two different universities notes and the notes were given out to the students the students have sent them to us and we are dealing with the contents because all of them assume that there is a sequence in the fossils, that the whales with legs turn into whales without legs, etc. And you can see it sequentially in the rocks. You can certainly see it sequentially in the museums, but that's an artificial arrangement. Now, when people say, how come you do so well in debates? I'll give you a couple of other clues. We've mentioned this before, but the first is to realize the power of words. The Bible says in the beginning was the word and that's a reference to Jesus Christ. And it says that his word is so powerful, a word from him and he can turn soil into trees. And Glenn's going to be talking about soil and Noah's flood a bit later. So all of these things are connected together. What does the word soil mean? In fact, in geology, there's some words in which when we've invented a name, and don't be surprised we can invent names because we're made in the image of Jesus Christ, who is the word. And when he speaks, things happen. When we speak, we identify things. See, you might as well give me the whole screen now for the moment, Sam, please. You see my nice set of quartz crystals here? Now, most of us just use the word crystals and don't even think of anything. But embedded into that word is our history of thinking. So when the Greeks used that word, they meant ice. I mean, have a look. Isn't that beautiful? i got thousands of crystals, and they're just absolutely magnificent. There is nothing nicer than going to a rock and smashing it. Well, it's not the smashing that's nice, but you smashed it because inside you found a nice cavity. I remember being way up north in Scotland, and I came across a rock that was full of beautiful blue and green and clear crystals. Yeah, looks like ice. So built into that word is the fact that we did not invent that concept until after we'd seen ice. There's time built into the word. So if you're debating someone, listen carefully to what they say and probably more importantly what they don't say. But most people use words without much knowledge. You see, this was a word, a name that could not have been invented till after Noah's day. Why? because God has revealed the whole history of the world, and in the beginning it was very good. We've stressed this time and time again. There was no ice. I mean, imagine it, walking around with no clothes on and plenty of ice out. You're not going to do it. Adam and Eve lived in a world where there was no winter and no summer. Those things don't come until after Noah's flood. So where do fossils fit into this? No fossils possible in, in the Garden of Eden. No fossils possible till after death. No fossil possible until after rapid burial. So when you have a look at this, don't be surprised. The history of the world, world is related to what you think about even where the words come from. Look at this nice one here. You see all my trilobites? 
Now, the man who invented that word in 1771 didn't have a clue what these things were. They just had three main segments, tri, lobe, ite. There's your lobes, right? So built into there was, well, first of all, his observation powers. Secondly, he could count to three. I mean, that's important because there are many people in the world whose number system just goes one, two, three, and many. So this guy could at least count to three. He could observe, and he knew they were some kind of a bug. In fact, in England, they became known as Dudley bugs. But these trilobites have a name, and the man who invented the name was sure that man was made in God's image in the beginning, and we had word power. So he invented a label, and it stuck. And it's meaningful because you too can see the three segments almost in both directions. Of course, then we've mentioned many times on this program about where our concepts of fossils come from, and it's got to do with that sort of thing. Now, yes, these used to be called by the ancient Greeks tongue stones. They thought they looked like people's tongues, right? And they regarded these fossils as tricks. Yes, fossils, tricks, philosophy, religion, Greek gods who played tricks on you. All of those things are built into the words that you use. And so as we talk about time and rocks and layers today, I noticed somebody took our title, Layers and Lias, L-I-A-S, and said, Lias, is that the French for liars? Well, where that word comes from, I was down on the south coast of, uh, of Wales and my escort was a, a Welshman. And uh, we were talking about the layers of rocks there, the fossils were in them. And we were actually in a section that used to be called the Lias, L-I-A-S. If you don't know it, most of our words in geology have an English origin or a Welsh origin. In this case, the word lias, which became a time period, actually is just the old Welsh word, well, there's liars and liars and liars, one on top of the other. It's their old word for layers. Layers and liars, liars and liars. Because today deals with how did we get from someone who believed in creation, someone who was so sure that if it looks like a shark's teeth, it probably is a shark's teeth, and really invented uh, pa paleontology with a Christian perspective up to the day where they're lying to us about you find fossil whales in this order. Well, are they whales even? How would you know? How do you define a whale? What's a whale for practical purposes? You need to know what words actually mean because you can be lied to so efficiently. Politicians are masters of it, aren't they? And so sadly is education. And hence those students who sent us the drafts of what they've been taught, the notes, the PowerPoints. And really, it's just tragic to see how they're being lied to because most of them today, well, come on, let's, let's be honest. Have you been down to your school board lately? Have you seen what's history? In England, history doesn't start till the Beatles in the 1960s. In fact, some people don't even go back past 2000. No, we need to know where something comes from because as I've said so often, even our words give away a history. Where it comes from tells you what it means. What it means tells you what it's worth. What it's worth tells you what it, you'll do with it. So if you think the liars is millions and millions of years old, the name is true, but originally it comes from a belief that the layers were put there in Noah's flood. You need to find out the context. Originally, these bugs were the handiwork of God the Creator, hence you could objectively give them a name. Well, let's jump up a little bit. My last specimen to show you at the moment. Can you actually see the fossil shell in the middle of that? That's the first fossil I ever found in the coal fields of England. Why did I recognize it? Well, you see, this little bug here in the middle is actually an Aussie. It doesn't live in England anymore. That little shell lives in Australia, not far from my house down in the mud. In fact, if you grab our DVD or our video or our streaming one online called World of Living Fossils, you'll see the one that I found down there. That's a lingular shell. A brachiopod, still alive today, used to exist in the millions according to the fossil record, and it has remained unchanged. Hmm, they're claiming whales have changed, but evidently lingular have not. But you see, the important part about this is that the reason I found this is that I was in the coal fields of England, that's my area of expertise, and I was following the 
well, I guess it's the university guidebook that was identifying the key markers, the index fossils, and this was one of them. If you find the fossil layer with all the lingula in, you know exactly where you are in the coal fields. So there is order out there. Um, lingula, but no evidence they've changed. Uh, how many millions of years did it take to get the layers there? Uh, what did the layers actually mean? All right, Sam, I'm going to uh, go to my slides now. Let's uh, bring this up here. All right. Now. Are we there, Sam? Your slides are up and ready to go, John. Okay, why isn't it functioning at this end? You need to click on your PowerPoint. Have you clicked on it? Yeah, I've clicked on the PowerPoint here. Okay. There we are. We're up. Yeah, there we go. All right, now, commercial pop break. Don't forget, those of you who live locally in southeast Queensland, in a few weeks' time, April 2021st, Diane and myself and Dr. John Osgood, our historian, will be running that seminar on Saturday afternoon and Sunday afternoon on how did people get to Australia? How did the Aborigines come? Where from? How many years ago was it? Great seminar. You'll enjoy it and be blessed. But here's what I'm doing. Missing Millions, part one, background of time. Uh, the British Natural History Museum put on a fabulous new display when they opened up first. I happened to be there on the history of the world, geology. And in fact, as you went round this, there's one of the things they said, the myth of a global flood. Notice you can detect their attitude towards the Bible. The myth of a global flood began about 5,000 years ago. Amazing. <laughs> That's roughly the conservative timing of Noah's flood in the Bible. Perhaps it's a story to explain the presence of fossil seashells on mountain sites around the Mediterranean. It has led to centuries of debate centered around the biblical story of Noah. Hmm. Then by the time you get up to their next board, which is the present unlocking the past, it, it introduces the current hero. By 1830, through the work of Scottish geologist James Hutton and Charles Lyell, it was clear that the earth is very old. Furthermore, given this unlimited allowance of time, processes of active, etc., etc., and it leads up to the theory of evolution. So what's not mentioned in those two boards? Oh, well done. What's not mentioned is they're a little out of date. You see, if you go back to Theophilus of Antioch, you discover that he was already into creation. Oh, Theophilus, God lover, God's friend. Creation occurred 5529 BC, plus or minus 200. Now, as I said before, the plus or minus symbology there didn't exist in his day. He just took a whole lot of words to say the same thing. Where did he get his dates from? The Septuagint. But he, notice this comment. He believed that the world was created only 5529 BC, not the tens of thousands of Plato, etc., has written. So there's nothing new about this whole debate. The term geology was then coined by the Bishop of Durham. Do you realise that much of what we call science today actually had a Christian origin? Um, science, um, science we, we deal with searching for the truth, we deal with evidence, we deal with thinking. Um, the term geology was coined by the Bishop of Durham. And they invented this word. You can, don't trust me, go and have a look at the, their, their website. The town is proud of this guy. He gave us a modern scientific word to distinguish earthly things from heavenly things. Now, you can prove this because as you travel around the world, and I'm grateful for friends and myself who are able to do this, you discover in Catholic Portugal, they believe that uh, 1485 was 6,685 AC, after creation, or AM, sometimes called Anno Mundi, the history of the world. You see, there's, there's a signboard put up in South Africa. A friend of mine who was on a trip to South Africa took that. Kate Cross in the year 6685. Wow. You see, it's not all begone and begotten to the evolutionists. There's still the evidence that the world was, well, they had a Christian view of things. Then you get up to these guys. Now, what have these guys got to do with geology? Well, you might be surprised that Martin Luther wrote the first real um, couple of pages on coal and Noah's flood. It's in his commentary on Genesis. 
you see, if people actually read this, they discovered that he knew all about coal mines and they mined coal even before they had theories of it. But you see, Luther wrote that it must have something to do with Noah's flood and the world was made in six literal days about 6,000 years ago. Likewise with Calvin. Now, for those of you who go to Presbyterian Church or Reformed Church, can I recommend you get back to Calvin? Because you find that his commentaries on the days of creation are far more valuable than some of the nonsense that's put it forth in your, uh, your, your colleges about the days being any length of time or millions of years ago, etc. But all of which brings us to this guy who was influenced by the Reformation, who had come from being a Catholic medieval superstitionist um, to believing Luther was right, that God had revealed his word. But yet he's responsible for the principle of superposition. And some of you have noticed, if you haven't yet watched it, go through our backlog and find our, our slides, etc., on our strata machine, etc. Um, there's no doubt about it. Nicholas Steena believed in six days of creation and a worldwide flood. Here's his concepts. The bottom layer formed first. Now, let's be honest. Steno, who sat in his nice little ivory tower for much of his life, ended up in the priesthood, etc. He um, he believed the bottom layer formed first. No, he never went out to see if this happened. He believed that the strata were laid down horizontally. No, he never went out to see this happen. This is his abstract thinking. Miles ahead of other people, but in reality... He uh, didn't go out to see if that's how rocks really formed at all. But then again, you see, people began to comment. John Ray, who sadly many of you have never heard of, but he was the guy very responsible for stimulating everything that Linnaeus gets credit for, inventing the concept of kind out of the book of Genesis, uh, genus, etc., is the word that is used in the Latin edition of your Bible, and that's what was around in his day. Kind is what you read in your modern King James. John Ray believed God created creatures separately. Then the physicist Hook. You may have learned Hook's principles when you dealt with springs and that, but both of them came out and said, if Nicholas Steno is right, if the layers formed on the bottom first, if they formed horizontally, if they form one on top of the other, then the world is too old for the Bible to be true. Why would they say that? Well, you go to the liars the layers in Wales, and if you start to argue that all those nice shells laying at beach level in the rocks are older, uh, if they form first than before the ones in the, the next layer, then they must be older. Then they must have lived and died. So each layer represents lifespans. So by the time you add up millions of lifespans, the rocks represent vast ages, not the six days of creation. Then you come across the influence of paganism. And what you're looking at is the effect of religion changing things in how people think about the rocks. Georges-Louis Leclerc de Buffon, he calculated Adam and Eve came into being six to 8,000 years before present. Um, Catholic France, why would you need to leave Adam and Eve in the story? Now, listen, I'm not wishing to be too sarcastic, but if you get rid of Adam and Eve, then your Catholic priest can't take up any offerings. If you get rid of Adam and Eve, then you can't do any masses and charge for it when somebody dies. So you have to leave Adam and Eve intact. In fact, just this last week, a student from a college, a reform college, got in touch with me and said, our lecturer said, it doesn't matter what you believe about the days of creation, as long as you treat man as being made separately. Well, that's what Louis Leclerc was doing, leaving the Catholic belief that man was, was different and man had to be treated as real even if the days of creation, well, look what Leclerc does. The earth had been in existence for 75,000 years. Can you see where it's going to? And in case you think we're exaggerating, there is a French book, um, The Story of Fossils, from the Paleontologic Institute of Paris. No one before de Buffon had mentioned figures of this magnitude. Now, I, I don't mean to be sarcastic to the French, but like most of us, they think their culture is the prime one. In fact, their language is so superb, they even have a group of scholars who make sure that you can't change the grammar or the meaning or anything. But you see, they're wrong. The ancient Chaldeans and the pagans before Noah, uh, sorry, before uh, the Reformation, ages ago, before Abraham, they had vast ages. 
in their, their world chronology. Buffon felt Noah's flood made little impact. Earth's geological features had come from normal everyday effects. Sound like what you're taught in university college? Sound like what you're taught with these students who sent their notes into us? In fact, in 1771, Buffon uses what would become known as Lyell's principle of uniformitarianism. Not by that name at that time, but that's where it's going. He divided Earth's history into seven epochs. Now, don't you hate history? All this stuff? Can I encourage you? Can I urge you? Can I push you to read your Bible? That's the real history. But then if you want to know why you're opposing these guys, read what they say as history. Why? Because where you think something comes from tells you what it thinks it's worth, tells you what you'll do with it. So if kids are just the result of sex, which is just the result of matter and time and energy over millions of years, they ain't worth anything. Yep. If you think homosexuality is just the result of choices you make or others make, then you pass regulations prohibiting others making rules to uh, allow you to change. That's just what's happened out here in one of our governments. Hmm. Seven epochs. In the seventh epoch, the power of man was added to nature. Still a concept of creation in there, but it's getting weaker and weaker. After Badabafon, you find James Hutton, a Scottish geologist. You say, why would these two have anything to do with one another? Can I be honest, as a Mackay, as a Scotsman, as, as a guy who realised that if we could chop England off, we would. I mean, we could build a big canal right across where Hadrian's Wall is and let the English float away because we just don't get along well with our Anglo-Saxon cousins down there and never have. But I'll tell you what, if the French say it, the English will reject it. If the French say it, the Scots will get on board fairly quickly, usually. Hmm. There's what Hutton said. Present day slow process, the layers in Wales, the layers in Scotland, the rocks all come from processes you can see around you. Now, the big problem Hutton has was that he was a Scotsman and hardly anybody understood what he was saying. Um, no sign of beginning or end. His work was largely rejected because the church in that day actually supervised what people thought about science. Hutton's work was atheistic. By the time you get to that picture, yes, I've actually been there. Hutton went there. It's in Jedburgh. Can you see the nice layers at the top? Can you see the gentlemen in their carriages? Can you see the landscape there? Okay. Now, Hutton went to Jedburgh. John Mackay went to Jedburgh. There it is today. If you think England has always been a lovely forested country, forget it. You saw the pictures. Back in the 1780s, this was nice cleared land where people lived. But I went there because of this nice little rough path which takes you right up to here. You see, Hutton was responsible for finding things that we now call unconformities, where he said rocks had been formed, laid down, action taken, and then he rode it away and he set out to prove it. Good on him. He had a belief. He had a, an idea. He needed to test it. Quite biblical. Whatever you think, go out and test, the Bible says. Test everything and only keep the things that are true, the scripture says. Nothing wrong with that. It should be the motto of every scientist. Can you see the different sorts of rock at the bottom? You see, by the time you get to 2024, the red layer there or the red line there marks the difference between the Devonian times and the Silurian times. Now, it's easy for me. I can take you to that place today. Jedburgh is a nice place to visit. Lovely big old abandoned um, monastery cathedral type there. But there's what you see in the textbooks. Devonian, 20 million years missing on top of the Silurian. Oh, but just like the Carboniferous rocks, the name was invented by a clergyman to describe the carbon in those rocks over there near uh, Newcastle. Devonian was named after a place called Devon. Silurian was named after another place on the edge of Wales, and none of them had anything to do with 10 or 20 million years in the beginning. All of this is a result of theory added to theory added to theory. Now we have 20 million years missing. Building on Hutton, the next hero of geology is Charles Lyell, another Scotsman. 
Are you getting a picture here? In fact, the universities that these guys went have not only taken up what they've said, they now represent the universities that built up the potassium argon, the uranium lead methods. They still push millions of years. Lyell, he accepted the present is the key to the past. He ran with Steno, the bottom layer is formed first. And now he's bold enough to go one step further. The fossils in the bottom layer must represent a record of life, not just a history of death. And he went one step further. So by the time you get to the Jurassic rocks and the others where the layers are fairly clear, he said you not only add up the lifespan, how long each creature would have lived, each layer therefore represents time. And therefore, if you find different fossils in the top layer than you find in the layer underneath, then you actually have to use the fossils to classify. Now, I'm sure some of you remember Dwayne Gish and some of the lectures that occurred with Dwayne. Dwayne was big on fossils, not necessarily on the history of geology, but he did score one point that was really worthwhile listening to. If you use the fossils to classify the age of the rocks, and then you use the age of the rocks to classify the fossils, you've gone around in a big, big circle and gotten nowhere. This is what Lyell introduced. There's his most famous disciple. You see, if Lyell had not existed, if nobody had his thinking, Darwin would have had nothing to run on at all because Darwin never had a single fossil to prove anything he said. He says that in his book on evolution. Read it sometimes. Despite the fact that the students who contacted us about this were being told that looking at the changes in the rocks tells you about life evolving. No, it may tell you what different fossils you've got in different layers, but unless you add Lyell and you add rocks are history, rocks are time, then Darwin's theory is not possible. See, there's what he said. I always feel as if my books came half out of Lyell's brain. Crystal, made from ice, really cold, not possible to invent that word till after Noah's flood. So the Greeks had a concept that once there was a world without ice, then there's a world with ice, and so do you and I. Of course, we stretch the ice ages way back before Noah's flood, um, but that's not what they did in the beginning. Charles Darwin borrowed Charles Lyell, and he wants someone to blame? Go with Lyell. Um, go with the Scots. Go with the French. Go with atheism that gave rise to ultimately this, where the legislation that's just passed here in Australia, you can't actually advise people they can be converted from homosexuality. You can't actually tell them they can be normal or you can end up in jail. Now, the trouble is the Bible says you can. The Bible says this problem is not caused by your belief in evolution. This problem is caused by sin. And sin can be dealt with by the Savior, who not only is the Savior, but the creator of the world, who actually made it in six days. And diagrams like that sold to the students at modern day universities through the lies of our whales growing uh, into animals that lived on the land. By the way, having previously been on the land, you might laugh at that, but they were cow-like creatures that went into the sea and lost their horns, horns and turns their udders into rudders, etc. And then they did it in reverse. All that is sold to students as a fact when it's really a fiction, but worse than a fiction. You see, Darwin went on to take Lyell and do that with it. If you find percentage difference in the rocks, even though you've never seen anything change, it actually is proof of evolution. Do you realize nothing has changed since they invented the word carboniferous in England? Uh, nothing has changed. We haven't seen anything evolve at all. We've just changed the way we see the rocks. We've changed the way we believe the rocks get there. So Darwin ends up rejecting Genesis and ultimately advising his son to oppose Christianity. And well, that's where most of the atheists are today. In fact, look at this book, The Fossil Revolution. Darwin was particularly worried because if the theory of evolution be true, it's indisputable that before the lowest Cambrian stratum was deposited, long periods of time have elapsed and that during these vast periods, the world swarmed with living creatures. Now, how good are you at thinking? Darwin realized that if what Lyell said was true, if what Steno said was true, if what Hutton said was true, then he needed vast quantities of age because he didn't see any of this in the rocks. 
Don't take my word for it. Read his chapter on geology where he says exactly that. Go and take a geology course like I did and ask your professor, well, if evolution is true, where is the fossils? And all of a sudden you discover there are no fossils showing this. It's a diagram in a textbook, a picture in a museum. But look at the, the, the book that finds that changed our view of the past. By the latter part of the 19th century, by Ellen Darwin using rates of erosion and deposition to estimate the Earth was hundreds of millions of years old. Now, boy, that's getting old real fast. By AD 2006, where I'm going to stop this part of it, the world was estimated to be approximately 4.6 billion years old. Now, can I encourage you as Sam starts to turn us back, make sure you get our free printed newsletters and our free electronic newsletters. Our printed newsletters are available free online. Our email newsletters, which come out every couple of weeks, Darwin does the, Diane does the editing of that. Then go to our Creation News website and actually sign up for them. They're free and free is the price you can all afford. Okay, Sam, bring me back to us here. All right, there we are. That's good. Now, I'm going to hand over to Glenn now for a small section on what's very interesting to give you a connection between the two. I got involved in coal geology. I was in big coal mines, and I was always asking the field geologists, well, if you say these fossil trees in the coal grew here, where's the soil? Right mm -hmm. now, That was my first research project with permission from the government to go in and do a week's research in this government mine, and yet there was no soil. And, and the geologist, had, you, you could tell he never even thought of that as a question. Now, over the years, I've gone and I've asked many soil experts, what, how do you recognise a fossil soil? And they said, that's not our problem. That's a geologist's problem. And then I'd go to the geologist and they'd say, that's not our problem, that's a soil expert's problem. Glenn, that's my little introduction to you. So take it away from there, then we'll have our first Q&A. Yeah, and I find it interesting that these polystrate trees that we find are always uh, embedded down into the coal. And we've seen that um, swamps don't make coal, they make soil. But that's coal that they're buried in, not soil. So we're going to go to my slides here. And let's see, I think it's this. By the way, Glenn, before, in case we've got new viewers, tell them what your background is. My background is soil science, soil physics. And I actually, my first love was in pedology, describing the soils and characterizing uh, the soils. And, and so where did you do this? Where did you actually do this? Um, LSU is where my BS and my master's degree were, and that's where I was on soil judging teams, and uh, then PhD at University of Arkansas. So that's what you were asking. That's what I'm asking. And what university yep. did you work at for much of your life? Uh, university of Tennessee, as well as uh, University of Nevada, as well. Okay, that's take it away. So. All right. So as John was talking about the layers, you know, one of the things that uh, the early developers you know, didn't have was the advantage of seeing these processes in action. We watched Mount St. Helens uh, on the TV and saw how it could just rapidly uh, create these these layers. And so geologists have uh, accepted, gone back to what they originally believed in catastrophic processes. Many of them have, I guess not all of them, uh, but they insert, as John has showed earlier, this missing time that there'll be a catastrophic process that'll lay down a layer, but then there's millions of years uh, till the next one. And you can see that here, these are pictures from the Grand Canyon and between layers, there may be 160 million to 12 million and we talked to previously about, well, what happens during that time? If there's missing time, um, you know, is that supported? Is that valid? Is it supported by science? Because things are going to take place. You're going to get plants growing. And if you're getting grasses growing on the surface and they die back each year, you're getting roots growing in the subsurface. That root system grew in one year. Um, all of those are depositing organic matter. And... Um, so at Mount St. Helens, when it was so devastated, they said, well, it's going to take 
hundreds. One person, scientists said it would take over a thousand years to get vegetation to come back into that area. It was so buried in sediment. And yet within just a short time, they have vegetation within just a matter of a few years. And I mentioned before that I went there 16 years later in those deposits and there was already soil profiles being developed. So what is a soil profile? Well, soil is a living being. It's got to have life for it to be soil. It's got to have a, a series of layers starting with the A horizon, which is an accumulation of organic matter. And it's very distinctive. You may have an organic layer at the surface with a, a lot of leaves, but you're going to develop this A horizon, which is the decomposed uh, organic matter. And that's a distinctive horizon that allows us to be able to recognize soils. And then you get a B layer, which is a weathered layer where there's been some translocation of clays and, and such, or a removal of the clays. And then you get down to a C horizon, which is down to your parent material that it's supposedly developed from. So what I wanted to talk about was we've mentioned before, when you look at the layers, whether you're in the Grand Canyon, like this picture we took from our rafting trip a few years ago, uh, or you're driving down the interstate here in Tennessee, you're driving anywhere or watching TV, just watch the old movies and you'll see everywhere over the world, you see these layers and they're just one layer stacked on top of the other. And the question is, where are the soils? So we have brought out in the past that, well, that's a good indication that these were laid down all at this very rapidly one time, a layer on top of a layer on top of a layer and laid down in lateral flowing system. But there is a thing called paleosoils, fossil soils. And this is a field of science that has really grown over the last couple of decades um, because they're going in and identifying these fossil soils that then they use to relate to climate change using proxy um, measurements of the climate. Well, in soil science, we look at paleosoils as identifying buried soil horizons. And I've used this in soils in my research to identify uh, buried soil horizons that give you a little bit of a history. In fact, there was one research project I was working on and I was finding these buried soils that look fairly recent. And I went and talked to the landowner. He goes, oh yeah, back when my dad bought this property, I remember him telling me about how, you know, 50 years before he bought the property in the 1930s, he went and tore all the trees down with a bulldozer, burned them, and then scraped all this, all of the material over to this area, filled in all the lower lying areas. I was like, oh, okay, well, that's pretty um, obvious from the buried soils. But what's going on in paleo soils in this field of science is they go in looking for buried soils. The problem is, this is a, in a review um, annual review, Earth, Planet, Science. They said recognition of around horizon boundaries is integral to soil description. Yes, it is. It's integral to classification. Yes, it is. But they say the task is m considerably more complicated in paleo soils. A horizon may be difficult to identify and may be entirely or partially removed by erosion. The original soil surface is seldom preserved. And what they go on to talk about is this A horizon, this critical, that distinctive horizon that constitutes a soil is missing. They don't find those. So they're basing it on other characteristics of what they would call a B horizon. Well, in soil science, you know, my question would be, where's this missing A horizon? Where did it go? Because we see all these layers laid out. Well, if the A horizon, the organic matter has been stripped off, where did it go to? Because in soils, we see this association, we call it a catena, with a landscape position. I remember in soil judging, we would travel around the, the state and into other states uh, looking at soils. And we were down in the Cajun area, the French area, and they had a transition of soils from the Grand Coteau to the Generet, uh, the Cajun French towns. Again, John, just like the um, rock layers are named after 
towns, the Jura Mountains. Um, well, we do the same thing in, in soils. And basically, it was just a slight slope, but you could trace the organic matter accumulation that made this generate a beautiful organic, we call that a mala soil, very productive, uh, but the upper hill slope positions were not. So where is the soil? They just can't find any soil, but they claim they find old fossil soils. Well, what's that based on? It's based upon other characteristics, changes uh, that they see. And sometimes it will be roots. They will find um, what they find or, or roots, uh, such as this one. I don't know if you see my arrow in, section, in slide B up there, um, but the roots aren't attached to anything. Um, so the question is, are, th are they really finding these B horizons? Because there are other processes that can develop voids in the soil that can be filled in with sediment, but it wouldn't be roots. Um, watch the video. This is from some of my research. As water infiltrates into the soil, it has to displace the air. Well, the air, when you've got a nearly saturated soil, as that water infiltrates, it's got to force the entrapped air out. And what it does is it just makes a void, a vertical path that'll look much like a root channel. Um, internal erosion, which is what I spent most of my end of my career studying, creates vertical and lateral voids. We call them soil pipes. Uh, so the question is, even if you found a buried root, is it an indication of where it grew? We see this all the time, polystrate trees. They're buried there, but they didn't grow there. That's their buried location. And then you have groundwater flow that translocates fines, that moves the fines around. I, I used to do a lot of work on colloid transport, and uh, you, you get water movement through the soil. Well, if these materials are laid down by water, there's going to be a redistribution of that water. There's going to be a translocation of fines and even a translocation of the calcium and other minerals in that water. So, and, you know, my view is, you know, even... You know, where, where are these soils? Because I don't see these paleo soils, these fossil soils. And the way it seems like to me a lot of this is used to describe these could very easily be explained by much more obvious uh, processes. And even if their, their soils are missing the A horizons, um, how do you still have these abrupt layers, these abrupt distinct layers because a bioturbation is going to be mixing those layers up if it's millions of years of time missing. Um, and so my question is, what kind of environment could produce that much sediment that doesn't have exhibit any evidence of any biological activity for millions of years? And if you don't have the biological activity, if you don't have the grass, you don't have good cover, you're going to get gullies. John, you may recognize the one on the upper right. That's from Australia when I came to visit you. Um, some of these others are, are from China and various places. This is from my research on gully erosion. And of course, then if it's out there and it has no ground cover, you're going to get gullies forming. And then you get another deposition event. Well, it's going to fill those in. And when you look at these layers, you ought to have just many, many, many gullies showing that are in field but we don't see that. So again, what kind of environment would leave the ground bare but not exhibit any evidence of erosion for millions of years? And um, I just think this whole idea that sediment can be laid down over this long period of time and have no soil development, no bioturbation, no erosion is just utterly preposterous. I, I like what these guys with Canyon Ministries, Nate Loper is now the executive director Bryce Brothers was also one of our guides on our trip. And they said, instead of believing in what's missing, time, soils, bioturbation, erosion, why not base your beliefs on what's observed? Um, kind of hard to argue with that. So I'm going to stop sharing and uh, go back to you, Sam. Uh, Sam, if you would, if you could zoom in on me for just one second, because I do find evidence of roots 
This is filled in roots. This came from a whole stump. I think this was in Nevada. Uh, John, you'll recognize this. We find these roots all the time, but they're never associated with a tree. <laughs> and these are filled in by the sediment, filled in the trace fossils. That's what I had to say. Great stuff. All right. Um, well, I think uh, we'll do a quick pit stop into a uh, brief Q&A and thank yous. Uh, so we've got to give a thank you uh, to Douglas Boffey, sending in two British buckaroos, a sheep, a dog, shaking his body from left to right, surrounded by le red hearts. There you go. There you go, a little dance for you. Um, you do that, same. <laughs> thank you, Clint. Um, Right, a uh, question comes in, uh, this for you, Glenn, uh, from Who Little or Me. Uh, what makes soil? It's the organic fraction. It's that it's a living being. You've got to have life. And where there's evidence of life, there's going to be organic matter. Uh, so that's really the distinguishing characteristic. And that's what's the distinguishing characteristics that's missing in a lot of these paleo soils. Whereas for a soil scientist, we find these fossil soils very obviously by the organic layer, by the organic matter. So. Glenn, um, just to throw some more in, I remember when you first came to visit us in Jurassic Ark, I asked you what you thought was one of the best evidences for Noah's flood, and you said the absence of the soil uh, layers. And of course, I'd never done much thinking about that except in the context of coal, but it's true of coal and it's true of the majority of the fossil record. Yes. So good point. But going one step further, you arrived at Jurassic Ark. Uh, do you remember what year it was? 2019. That's right. Just before August. some of the big floods up north and things like that. So yeah. but one of the things that uh, we wouldn't have stressed at that time that Diane and I particularly struggled over um, much of the area at Jurassic Arc had been cleared during the gold mining periods in Gympie, which is the uh, 1780s, 90s, etc., right, right up to World War I and still occurring today. Um, they don't use the, the local native forest for mine props or anything anymore. Mm -hmm. But then the regrowth of the trees, etc., was hindered by the fact that in the time the mining it occurred the soil is depleted the one thing that's very obvious given any time of exposure at oil is the loss of soil particularly if there's no vegetation already on it but we had to struggle because diane you might remember we uh, cleared the whole area we sort of got the soil from where we dug up the fossils and spread it around and we put plants in and grew nothing Right. The, it was very evident that soil was more than just minerals and particles of stuff dumped uh, on a bed with seeds mm. planted into it. So we struggled for years. We got the best fertilizer. We got water. We actually uh, got the best plants. Right. You know, we paid the most for the seeds, etc., and really achieved very little until, Diane, we actually added some things to the soil. Do you remember what we added? Well, we brought in tons and tons of mulch and then we added worms. That's it. That's we added the living bit. So if you thought Glenn was sort of over the moon when he said it's a living substance, we really had to add stuff that had been alive. We actually, it cost us a small fortune to reactivate the minerals that were obviously available. We had a, a, a moderate percentage clay sand so the clay was full of minerals, but they weren't accessible under normal circumstances. And then we added mulch and things grew a little bit better, but not much. And then we added worms. And by worms, I mean we had a few giant earthworms that we discovered living in the forest that was still a forest about a kilometre away. And boy, once we added worms, what happened, Diane? Oh, it just transformed it completely. The plants oh. started to grow and flourish, even though they were getting the same water and growing yeah. in the same mineral content, yes. Yeah. And we never had to add any more fertiliser. The worms did it for us going round and round and round. And we could tell we were succeeding because now we can dig up the soil and you find handfuls of worms. The yeah. place, the soil is biologically active. Hence, Glenn, mm. you've actually poured plastic down, uh, you know, l l l some sort of stuff down wormholes, haven't you? Or ant holes. What did you do that for? 
Yeah, the ant holes, those, that was a, a melted aluminum, but we did a lot of dye staining of them and we did do other types of, you know, trying to fossilize essentially and recreate the actual paths. But uh, right. most of it was dye staining to, for, because we were interested in preferential flow. We weren't interested as characterizing the, the, the pore as much as just being able to track its flow paths uh, yeah. until I started work on piping. Yes. Yeah. So therefore, oh. I hope you gave three days notice to the ants you were going to pour molten aluminium. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, no, a bit of, you can see them in the, in the uh, metal. You can see them. Uh, yeah, but yes. Diane, just to stress this, some of the mm. things you've worked on, the bio um, cycles that are occurring mm. in the soil. So apart from yeah, worms, yeah. what else? I mean, if we were adding mulch, what was one of the living things in the mulch that was actually being added by us unconsciously? Well, there are lots of microbes and also fungi. Uh, so, in fact, it's it's a whole ecosystem um, and it had to be all there for it to really flourish, where you've got interaction between the, the microscopic and the, the macroscopic, the things that you can see. And... It's alive and functioning. As Glenn said, soil is something that is actually living and it's a whole ecosystem of um, small microscopic organisms, things that you can just see like fungi and things that you can easily see like worms. And we have some big ones in Australia, don't we? Yeah, we do. I'll and usually at a, sorry, I was going to say, usually after a, you know, a mine, you've got to get the pH right. That's the, the first thing. Mm -hmm. It's because they're usually acidic. Um, but it's amazing to me how quickly the land reestablishes, not just at Mount St. Helens. In our area that we lived in North Mississippi, it was called the Badlands. It looked just like the Badlands in South Carolina. It was just gullied. It was after the Civil War, everything went into cotton production. And that's a very erosive system and just stripped the, the land out and it was just gullied. So in the 1930s, they started taking land out of agriculture and putting it into trees. Within 30 yeah. years, it was just completely yeah. vegetated. It's just yeah. amazing how quickly. I wanted to yeah. show you one other thing. Sure. So this is what I studied with soil pipes. And so this is a naturally formed soil pipe um, because as water moves in these perch water tables to the opening through the soil, um, the iron precipitates out and sometimes you'll get it to stabilize the ground around the pipe. So hmm. just a little interesting. Okay. It is. One last comment from me before we take the next question, Sam. And that is our guy who's missing today, Craig, he's actually leading a field trip up into the interior of Tasmania looking for trilobites. Remember the uh, trilobites we showed you, the name invented in 1771 by a Christian creationist, a believer in Noah's flood. Did they tell you that in your geology course? They leave the real history out so they can give you the impression we thought all of this up all by ourselves starting from zilch, which is rubbish. We started with a Christian belief that God had created, that he put law and order, and even in the fossils, if it looked like a shark's teeth, it was a shark's teeth. Well, Craig has been a, a, a forester for a long time, and he's let us in on a few little secrets, because one of our failures at Jurassic Ark has surprisingly been with our native gum trees. We thought since they were native, we could just bring them. We got specimens from all over the planet, oh, sorry, all over Australia, and planted them. And I'll tell you what, the biggest disaster followed as most of them struggled and some of them died. So we brought in our chief forester from Tasmania and said, what are we doing wrong? And he said, well, here's what we found. If you have gum trees and you clear the forest, then the rest of the bugs that depend on that gum tree, within a few years, they'll die out too. And so if you want to replant gum trees, you have to replant all the bugs, the bacteria, the fungi said, because if you don't plant all three at once, you get none of the above living. So soil is, as Glenn said, an active living thing that produces a very distinct level. And it's the thing that really is. I've asked for that. I've been much of the planet. I've asked it's missing from the majority of the fossil record. And that is a killer. Great thought, Glenn. Okay, next question, Sam. 
Uh, I just thought I thought it would be quite because uh, Glenn, you mentioned about um, pouring uh, aluminium down um, uh, an ant's nest. I thought it'd be quite cool to to show show that a little bit. Um, so that is the um, that's the act of pouring the uh, the metal into an ant's nest, and this is something that comes out absolutely beautiful. Um, it kind of looks like a tree, actually. So that, there you go. If you if you're looking for a different Christmas tree this year, just get yourself an ant's nest. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I thought it'd be interesting to show because it, it, it is genuinely really pretty. I mean, some of them are very small, but you can get ones that are massive and they're, they're very, yeah. very... It, and mine was given to me by a friend because um, he did it and gave it to me. So it's, it's a right. little dangerous. So Yes, yes. But please, please be supervised if you're going to do, <laughs> do yes, it. Yes, don't want to pour it in if there's a you know shallow water table or after a rain if there's much moisture <laughs> in the ground. It gets a little yep. violent. Any uh, other questions, Dan, before we get there? Yes. Um, question here from Douglas Boffey. Uh, approximately how big are these soil horizons? Well, you know, it just depends on the soil and the conditions because uh, I used to tell my wife about my research in China, and I love the soils, these beautiful soils. And uh, it's called the black soil region. And she just thought it's dirt. You know, it's soil, you know, um, till she came with me to the black soil region and she saw that uh, you could have these black and I'm talking black, the color, you know, of my phone, black organic layers that will be a meter deep um, and just gorgeous. It depends on. So those were prairie soils, which grew a lot of grass, um, but you can lose that pretty quickly if you start tilling it up. And uh, I used to do work in the rice fields of Arkansas, really a, an ugly soil without much organic matter. But it had a really nice clay layer that held the water up so that you could keep the land flooded. And those uh, would go down another meter in that clay layer until we got permission to look at a virgin soil because the Germans that settled in that area were really good at taking care of the land. And when you looked at the virgin soil, I mean, it was half a meter deep of this beautiful black organic A horizon. But after, you know, a hundred years of agriculture, it had lost all of that. Um, so it depends on how it's been treated and how it's been taken care of. Sam, I can see one question here, which as an Aussie, I'll answer and then we'll go on to the next part. It says Australia has trillions of bugs through and the biggest. So why is it so barren? Uh, remember how Diane made the point that you, we have many bugs in all of this. We added the compost, etc. But you mentioned one thing that is missing in much of Australia: water. Yeah. Right. So if water. you don't put the water there, the bugs may hibernate. We have bugs that will go in. I mean, like our our desert frog. Uh, when he senses the, the the world is drying out, he will bury himself, swallow a lot of water. And in fact, the Aboriginals who can recognise a bulge in the ground is liable to be a frog will dig him up and squeeze him to su survive the drought themselves. So these are good water containers. But without the water, you get none of the other things actually operating. So don't be surprised NASA is looking for water in Mars uh, superficially to pretend they want to put space stations there. Really, their aim is to prove that life is possible elsewhere and it evolved by itself, <clears throat> haven't, haven't found it at all. But in reality, if you want to know the history of Australia, when the settlers moved into South Australia, it was green. It wasn't desert. You could go all the way up to the centre and it was green. In fact, the settlers moved up. They built houses, set up farms until they finally realised this was just an odd year in, in, uh, in South Australia's history and the grass began to wither. And by the late eight, uh, middle to 1800s, they had to draw a line across middle northern South Australia and say no settlement any further in fact, to be honest, it was well over 100 years before the next lot of rain fell and it went green. I know I was up there. It was just absolutely beautiful. And it happened like that. So the bugs could hibernate, the seeds could hibernate, regenerate, yes. etc. But that one ingredient of water is absolutely necessary. Let me move to the yes. next section here. Okay. Whoops. 
Okay, am I up, Sam? You are now. Good. Okay, don't forget Diane's uh, constant promotion of our newsletters, electronic and print. Um, let's quickly go through bookkeeping on time because you need to see this to get the real point. There's Nova Scotia, Canada. Yes, I took that picture. My camera was slightly out of focus, but I'll tell you what, it's important because in 1986, more than 100,000 bones were found in this fossil deposit at the bottom of the layers there, including crocodiles, sharks, lizards, fish and dinosaurs, etc. Notice anything? Because it's got all this on a sign just a little way away from the cliff. That's also on the sign. Red layer, black layer, red layer, black layer, red layer, black layer. Obviously a pattern that's there and they've got all the names and supposed times and eras down the side. But yet when you check the textbooks, they tell you that this thousand metres of rock in that vast cliff um, that was there in Nova Scotia took 40 million years to form. Fine. Uh, what happens if you start doing the real maths? Because to be honest, people are hopeless at big figures. They never check. Uh, I mean, most politicians know that if they want the voters to be proved, to be enticed, they'll say, we guarantee 30 million to be set aside for farmers. Well, there's 31 million farmers. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't help the farmers at all. Okay, the rate of formation here, a thousand years to cover your big toe. What do we mean by things like that? If you divide the time by the supposed distance of rock formed, then you end up with a problem all around the planet. In fact, if you have a look at this map here, and yes, I've walked that entire coast. In fact, I've walked much of the British coast and much of the Alaskan coast and much of the West American coast. Um, and here's what you notice. We're going to salt burn on sea. There's where I have to end up. And yes, I did get wet. And yes, there were great rocks around there on the cliff. And yes, look what I found. It's now in our Joseph Museum in the UK. Can you see, well, take you a bit closer. Can you see the scallop shell, the pectin shell? Can you see that large equisetum, the plant with the stripes on it? In fact, going back a bit further, this has become a site which is well known in the geological fraternity. Um, salt burn, well, salt, you know what salt is. Burn is usually a, a little creek uh, in Old English, etc. They've even got a, a, a diagram from the Geological Society. Thanks, guys. But look at some of the things it says. This 170 metres of strata you can see from the top of Warsaw Hill represents, what does that say? Nearly 16 million years of our Earth's history. In fact, let's go. There's 16 million years worth of layers from the top of the hill down to the place where I found the fossil. Now, it's easy if you say it quickly, but look what happens. If you divide 170 metres by 16 million years, it took you approximately 2,500 years to cover your big toe. I'll guarantee they never did that in your geology course. I'll guarantee they said it so quickly, you didn't even question the thought in your mind. In fact, there's my big toe with, with boots on, of course. There's my hammer and there's the specimen. So how big is this specimen? Well, there it is close up. In fact, when you look at the pectin shells in the UK, this is Jurassic rock. The pectin shells, you know the scallop shells down the beach. You know, how long would it last? How long would a plant last if you took um, the time allegedly hidden in their answer to actually bury the fossil? That fossil there was eight millimetres, a third of an inch thick. At one one hundredth of a millimetre per year, it would take 800 years to cover this fossil. Now we're back to Glenn's problem. After one one era to bury one hundredth of a millimetre per year, 800 years burying that scallop or burying that plant, there's not going to be anything left. Now, this is not the, I'm not the first person to make this point. I give full credit to Derek Ager, who wrote that book, and I'd encourage you to read it. And no, he's not a creationist. Yes, he did hate the creationist. B, he's now dead and changed his mind. Sure, for sure, I'm absolutely convinced of that. But he recognised this before he passed. If one attempts to calculate the rates of sedimentation in the past, the results are usually ludicrous. Soil takes time to form. 
The absence of soils mean it either was never there, it was washed away real quick, take your pick, but it's not there. But the minute you try to calculate the rates of sedimentation, you get ludicrous results. Now, a couple of weeks back, we were doing the geologic column and somebody brought up this system in, in, uh, in uh, North Dakota. A real well log, as I said, I've traveled all around the planet. I get to go to see many of these places. This is the well log from Hunter State Larson. Why is it famous? It's one of the few well logs where you can, well, you can characterize each section of it as being in the normal order that's in the textbooks. And we have here, well, the tertiary Fort Union formation is found at 100 feet. Oh, now look, stop a moment. Have you ever bothered to find out why we call rocks? I mean, the tertiary Fort Union formation, I have collected from the Fort Union formation, but it took me a long time to ask this question. Tertiary means number three. Why did we call a whole heap of rock layers number three? The answer is simple. You start with a Christian worldview and the first rocks that God made, the primary rocks, were the base of the creation rocks in creation week. Nothing died. Nothing was buried. There were no fossils, right? Um, not tertiary. That was primary rocks. Then the secondary rocks occurred when animals could die after sin, when they could be buried after Noah's flood or during Noah's flood. So primary from creation, secondary from the time of Noah's flood and tertiary from Noah's flood onwards. Now that system is still intact. Cretaceous simply means chalky, come from the French, but it's borrowed by the English more large because of the white cliffs at over. Notice the depth that we find them at the side. Now I could bore you with all these names. Triassic means three colors, nothing to do with millions of years. Permian, well, Charles Lyell gave us that word because the king who was the Tsar's cousin sent Charles Lyell and the others across to work on a new species, new series of rocks that have been found at Perm, named after a place. Pennsylvanian, well, that's because the Americans can't spell Carboniferous. It's the rocks in Pennsylvania. Notice the depths that we're finding them at. In fact, you can go all the way right down to the bottom, Mississippi, and all the way down to Devonian, all the way down to Silurian, all the way down to Ordovician. Now, we're back to England. That's where the Ordovician people used to live on the border of England and Wales. And they're currently extinct. And this is a joke in geology. If you find a rock, with lots of shells in it and fossils that are currently extinct, you name it after the currently extinct people. Catch it? No, most people never do, but we geologists have a weird sense of humour. Down to Cambrian, then Precambrian, there's the bottom of the well, 15,064 feet. Yes, you're like me. When are the Americans going to go metric? It makes mathematics a whole lot easier, but we can use it because there's the question. I remember giving this question to a practical geologist who was struggling with the age of the earth and the Bible. And I asked him, we're standing here, you're an oil driller, there's your oil well, how far down to the oil layer? He said about 3,000 feet. I said, okay, in the 300 million years from that layer to the present, how long, how much rock formed each year? He'd never done this sort of maths before. 14,945 feet at this well formed in 600 million years. That's approximately one forty thousandth of a foot per year, approximately three ten thousandths of an inch per year, or you can put it into metric. Or if you like to stand there and wait for your big toe to be covered, it will be 3,300 years before your big toe is covered. And you're going to be dead and fallen over and decayed long before that. So we're looking at impossibilities. In fact, if you like me to throw in the diagrams, Here's a cross-section of Alberta. I, I throw in this because I was doing a debate in Alberta and the guy opposing me said, oh, look, we've got a complete geologic record in Alberta. And he started to tell me all about this. Now, by the way, the different colours do not go right across the map. So, therefore, the, the well log is not complete at all. The, the chequered brick-like ones usually represent limestone of some sort. But giving you the whole section in that debate, before you get over to the metamorphics on the left-hand side, there's what you've got. Three kilometres formed in 600 million years. To cut to the gist, that's four to 5,000 years to cover your big toe. You are not going to bury a plant fossil. 
you are not going to bury a shell fossil. You're not even going to bury your big toe. So if you want to deal with reality in the geologic column, then you have to deal with the fact that the time isn't there. And if there's no soil, that isn't there either. So therefore you have to ask, what would deposit this fast enough to actually preserve fossils or preserve oil? Remember that geologist I was standing on the cliff there at his well site? And I said, okay, divide the, the distance to 3,000 feet by your 300 million years, and what's the answer? He just puzzled a little while and he said, you wouldn't get any oil at all. It just would be decomposed before it was buried. You see, he hit on the truth. If you actually deal with the real depths, if you actually deal with the supposed real figures, then one divided into the other gives you an absurd answer. Only options, there are huge gaps in the record or else you're reading the record in the wrong way. And that's the point that Derek Ager made. And you people out there have to come to grips with that, that Noah's flood has and is and always has been and always will be a way better explanation for producing so many fossils on such a global scale. You can put it into a kid's rock, a song about lots of water and lots of mud, or you can be objective and say, here's what we would expect. And you, you have to get rid of Steno. As much as we love him for identifying shark's teeth and forcing us to reality, when it came to rocks, bless his heart, but he started on the wrong foot and Charles Lael built on it, Charles Darwin built on that, now Dawkins, Attenborough, the BBC, the ABC in America, and they have been led astray just as the theological student was being led astray who contacted me last week and said, the lecturer said we only have to worry about man made in the image of God. No, you have to worry about everything God said because he didn't take millions of years to make the first day of the week. The first day of the week is tied into the coming of Jesus Christ. That's how interconnected all these things are. Well, let me just finish here by reminding you before we go back to our last section on a few questions and then Sam will close us off. We yet do have a free newsletter. We do have an, a, a meeting coming up here in Australia. Keep your eyes on our, our website. If you live in southeast Queensland, that's just southwest of Brisbane, from Adam to Australia. Where do the Aborigines come from? How long have they been down under? Who owns the land? Et cetera, et cetera. Okay, Sam, bring it back to me. Okay, any thank you, Sam? Uh, I'm trying to navigate things whilst being attacked by a, a, a furry animal, so do bear with me. Um, uh, yeah, uh, we've got... I don't think we've had any f uh, further thank yous, uh, but we can do... Um, well, I've got this, this is an interesting question. sort of um, deals with the flood and layers and things like that. A uh, question coming from Twitch... Uh, a lost uh, knight for the cross has asked the question. Excuse me, thank you. Uh, has asked, uh, "Do you all believe in the firmament?" Well, if by firmament you mean a layer of waters above, you can ask and answer this question as many ways you like. But here's the reality: the firmament that you're talking about doesn't seem to be there anymore. So if you think of the layers of waters above as traditionally has been existing in geology and in theology, God formed the waters on the ground, He then on the earth, the world was covered with water. So don't be surprised, it's always been cool. It's never been a hot earth. And then he split the waters below from the waters above. And then you end up with words like the firmament, uh, a, a layer or a, 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 a space in between the first layer of water and the second layer. The layer of water came from the earth and it was split above. You can have almost any opinion you want about that because that layer doesn't appear to be there anymore. Anybody else want to add any more comments to that? Well, yeah, this just one of the really debated topics even among creationists is the, the use of that word firmament in, in what it means. I think it's very clear on day two that he separated liquid water from vapor water but this other band out there, you know, we don't have the evidence for it, but may very well be. So it's kind of like John said, it's whatever you want to believe. It's not one of these things I would get hung up on. You know, that'd be my opinion. 
There was enough moisture left in the atmosphere, however, for 40 days and 40 nights of rain. So when that collapses, any apparent or intermediate firmament would disappear and there's nothing there at the moment. So if you want to go on a space ride up to the moon or are past the moon, you don't need to put an umbrella on the front of your spaceship at all. That layer of water is gone. And I'm pretty yeah. sure that water would have moderated the climate up till the days of Noah. Any absence of that water and your climate is now much more erratic as you and I well experience. One more question, Sam. All right. Uh, let's do let's do this one. Um, so Douglas asked this question, uh, guys. I think we should uh, throw it to the other side. Uh, see how they answer this question. Uh, how did worms evolve? I'm assuming that says according to evolution. Um, anyone care to weigh in on the supposed well, evolution? Of worms? To start with. Well, the the standard story is that worms were one of the first things to evolve because they have a fairly simple structure. Uh, but uh, the standard story is we started off with single cells which somehow got together and made um, sort of group cells and then <clears throat> they started to specialise and so you have different uh, specialist cells all within the, um, the one structure. So worms uh, are considered to be fairly early on in that process but if you actually look at worms they're, they're quite complicated and they're well designed for the work that they've been given to do in the soil um, so uh, how did worms evolve well worms couldn't have evolved because if you go from a single cell to a worm you've got a huge amount of new information that's needed and we have no idea how that could happen all by itself you cannot get information without a mind being on the job. So if you want to make worms, and uh, scientists are actually working on biomechanists, so working on things that can actually sort of wriggle on the ground like worms, it's a useful thing to be able to do. And it requires a lot of clever engineering and a lot of um, clever biomechanics. So how did worms evolve? They couldn't have evolved but That's there's plenty right. of evidence that they are well designed. <laughs> now, if you've never seen a fossil worm, there's one from my collection. I have dozens of them. Uh, can you spot him just there? All right. All right. That's oh, he is. Is. Yeah, mm. there he is there. Notice he's preserved with his little um, segments uh, all going through. He's a marine mm. worm, but I have plenty of fossil worms, uh, particularly down from uh, Kangaroo mm. Island. The Cambrian worms, etc., that they're supposedly right on the Cambrian pre Cambrian boundary. So, the one thing is evident they appear and they fit the same characteristic that puzzled Charles Darwin. When worms first appear, they seem to always reproduce worms, which, by the way, even if you put the layers in vast amounts of time, worms produce their own kind and they are easy to recognize. I took a young girl on one field trip down on Kangaroo Island, had a look at some of the rocks. And there were worms, and I asked them what they were, and she said they're worms, right? So you don't need a PhD in wormology to, to recognise a fossil worm at all. They shout, 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 I am created. I've been a worm ever since I got on this planet, and it's been <clears> talking to <throat> Diane for more than half an hour. Without worms, nothing happens in the whole life cycle. So that's, that's how crucial that they really are. Sam, we're just about out of time now, so if you want to round things off, and that I will. I'll do, I'll do a brief read of scripture. I think it would be a good way to sort of close things off before I do a few adminy things. Uh, this is from Luke 19, uh, starting in verse 37 to, and then going to 40. Uh, then, as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord peace in heaven and glory in the highest and some of the pharisees called to him from the crowd teacher rebuke your disciples but he answered and said to them i tell you that if these things if these should keep silent the stones would immediately cry out mm. and that's what we see all throughout um all these rock layers and soil and goodness knows what else it all declares the glory of god um even if 
there's no one to, to proclaim the glory of God. It's all it's all to do with um, you know, it's all to do with creation and, and showing the the wonders of of creation and, and and also as well showing the fall as well and how relevant that is to us. Um, but a few bits of admin before we uh, uh, wrap up, um, John. If you do need to dip out, then feel free. Um, but uh, just a little plug here: uh, we did launch our uh, new streaming site, Creation Research Live, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so if you don't know about it, uh, if you're new to the channel and the live stream, uh, welcome. Please do like and subscribe. It is free and it does help us out. But this is something that you can get a bit extra for and help support Creation Research whilst you're doing so. Um, this is some of the benefits. So it, it's a monthly subscription, um, or you can do a yearly subscription if you really want to. Um, seems to be very popular with our existing subscribers currently. Uh, it's very similar to how a Netflix or Prime Video works. We've got exclusive content coming coming um so and so it'll be exclusive content like videos and also live streams that we'd never be able to do on platforms like youtube um for fear of being shut down um free content as well there's a selection of free content there'll be more going up soon uh, and also no more adverts on youtube um how many times have you uh, watched a creation research video and you've had an ad halfway through or had like 10 ads before the beginning of a video i know it does get annoying um so uh, uh why you see our live it's easy to use it's truth filled it's family friendly we've got exclusive content coming and it's also available 24 7 even when we're not uh and uh if you want to have a look at the pricing so he starts at 9.99 us dollars for the monthly subscription and the yearly subscription is around 90 us dollars uh pr gives you a little bit of a discount if you do take out a year um so if you are interested uh you can get a free account and check out some of the free videos there's no pressure to sign up for the paid stuff um you can go to uh, www.creationresearch.live and sign up for a free account i do encourage you to do so there's tons of content on there uh it is really really great and also a quick little plug as well we have mentioned this a couple times in the live stream tonight but please do sign up to our newsletters um if you want to uh they are free uh they're filled with great content <coughs> great little bits of information uh so please do go to linkin.bio forward slash creation research or if you've got a smartphone you can pull up your camera now and scan that fancy QR code with your smartphone camera and that will take you to our page where it's got links to all of our museums, our main website, our how to sign up to the newsletters, how to donate, all that sort of thing. Um, so please do go and sign that, uh, sign up to there. Uh, we don't spam you, do we, guys, with emails, do we? Yeah. No, we don't. We're spam free. Um, but yes, yeah, so thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in uh, to this uh, very, um, well, layers of knowledge filled uh sorry i had to had to be done at some point this evening um <laughs> i can see john rolling his eyes um uh, but yeah thank you for joining into the live stream uh do tune in next week uh where we'll be doing part one of our easter special we'll be talking about uh well easter everything to do with easter uh where it comes from that sort of thing uh, we'll be covering over the next sort of two weeks uh the crucifixion um and why it's important um and yeah so please do check it out um so thank you very much for tuning in any other last words guys no goodbye and god bless yes I think yeah, that's next one back again yes exactly see you next week guys god bless, god bless.